from that. Thank you, Oscar. Well, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, got disoriented. It's strange for an Oriental, isn't it? Um, this is 2010, but if we chalk it off into our current calendar count, it would be 2,749, which means that our history reached way back beyond the Common Era into the 8th century uh, BCE. So uh, all history tells us that we traversed through or from uh, Gobi Desert all the way into the land that we are in now, which is Burma and Thailand area. So we are indigenous to that area for twice as long as the Burmese have been there. I emphasize Burmese because I would like to you to go away knowing that there is a distinction between Burmese and Karens. It is the Burmese government, military government, that is uh, perpetuating this aggression against our people and, and doing the ethnic cleansing. So uh, having said that then, um, our people have been a subject race all these years because by nature our people are very docile. Uh, we are very reticent and also we like to avoid conflict. And it is for this reason that the uh, aggressive um, uh, hegemonic Burmese easily come over and come over and take come and take over our place so easily because we just move, move, move until we are now up in the hills. Uh, remember two, two years ago, perhaps, in May, we had Nagas that hit Burma, the worst storm. Now, that was very much populated by our current people. This is the rice growing area. And now you wonder why the government was very slow in letting aid come in. In fact, they blessed that na storm Nagas because they take it as a sign from God that Korean people are going to be wiped out. Because they, even in the history of oh, uh, 1990, they said that the only way you would be able to see Koreans would be in the museum. And that, this is the agenda that they have to ethnically cleanse our people. And see, the Burma, I, you may have heard of Burma, uh, more so than we have heard of Karen, right? Because in the Western mind, K-A-R-E-N is associated with a beautiful girl's name, Karen. Right? But unfortunately, the, the British had taken or corrupted the Thai word that they used for us, Karen, which by the way is a derogatory uh, name uh, that they use us, like the uh, animals in the jungle. Uh, something like that. And so the, ex ex uh, the British experience in using that has not been a, a blessing to us. Nonetheless, we've been given some lemons and we we're going to make lemonade out of it and see how well the lemonade stand goes. So it is a privilege for me to be able to let the audience know who the Koreans are. Because when you read the newspaper account, we always hear Burmese activists, Burmese refugees. But most of the activists, or rather I won't say most, the activists that they are talking about are Karens. The refugees that they are talking about are Karens. Very uh, relatively speaking, they are Burmese refugees. But those Burmese refugees are not us. We are Karen refugees. Like for example, in the border areas which I visited, uh, there are a total of um, nine refugee camps making up all, over 150,000 refugees. Nine to one, nine, or 10 to one, Karens are the refugees there. The Burmese are a very small portion of it in those refugee camps. And so, uh, see, the media, mog mogul, media moguls, for some reason, maybe uh, I'm hoping that it is just their 
mental indolence that has kept them from uh, not finding out who the Koreans are, but they just lump it all us, uh, lump it all as Burmese. But yet, at the same time, you have heard of Tibetan refugees. You have heard of Tibetan uh, activists. Now, their land, is, their situation is very similar to ours in that China has taken over their land. And recently, the Uyghurs, they too have been taken over by the Chinese. Yet, the media calls them Uyghurs activists or Tibetan activists. So for that same reason, we Karen would feel that we should be given credit where credit is due because many of the things that Karen activists have done goes to the credit of the Burmese activists. And that's been the history of our time. Our history is very much like a Shakespearean tragedy. You know, everybody, uh, we do the hard work, Abda gets the glory and the fame. We even have a saying in our Karen language, our people are like the leaf and other nations are like the thorns. When the thorn, when the leaf falls on the thorns, the thorns get, uh, the leaves get pierced. When the thorn falls on the leaf, the leaf gets pierced. It's the same way we are, our nation are like eggs, but other nations are like rocks. When an egg falls on the rock, the egg crashes. And when the rock falls on the egg, the eggs crash. Well, can't win for losing. And it even says, uh, when the Burmese, uh, when the Karen, uh, or the, when the Burmese steps on our own ears, the Burmese find us. When the Burmese step on our own ears, the Burmese find us. So there we are. This is the situation we are faced with. And for 60 years, uh, we've been trying to get uh, independence or at least autonomy, a certain type of autonomy from our state. Because Koreans make up one seventh of Burma's population. And that's about seven million. We're not a small group. Uh, Israel has less than that, but they are well known. Of course, they have the big bucks behind it. And we, we do have resources. That's another reason why the Burmese are uh, perniciously trying to take our land away because they have used up their resources. Our land is where all the uh, timber, the teak, that uh, famous teak, and all the minerals like wool from tungsten, they are there. But we don't have the uh, media exposure. And certainly thank Ms. Osterhaus and Kajora for giving us this opportunity to let the world know that Koreans exist. There's at least seven million of us in Burma, and we have some in, chi in China and in Thailand as well. And if we are to, and there's some even count as high as 14 million. But we don't have charismatic figures like uh, Dalai Lama or Rabia, I think his na her name is Rabia Kabir, I think she is an activist. Of course, she also has big bucks. And she is a very active lady. Uh, I read her bio just recently, very synchronistically. I came across her three days ago, and I've been passing it out. Because if the Uyghurs, who I didn't know about a year ago, can be uh, acknowledged as a activist and their names get out, we Karens who've been fighting for 60 years should have a recognition that we've been fighting for democracy. Our people are very uh, egalitarian, actually. We don't even believe in a, a feudal system. We share everything. And this is why, because of our generosity, it's been taken advantage of. Unfortunately, like, uh, I think his name is James Kavanaugh, I believe. He has written a poetry, his poem is called, uh, They are men too gentle to live among wolves. Uh, and this is a situation we are in. And I think uh, Steve may be able to elaborate more on that because he is familiar. See, I had the unfortunate uh, experience of not growing up 
in the Korean community, so I don't know too much about the Korean community. I was cocooned, sh uh, kept in a, uh, a, sh a spot where I was shielded from a lot of these atrocities and the vicissitudes that the Korean people have, have had to go through. See, I had a privilege of a British education and uh, enjoyed the beneficence of the colonial system. And I am very fortunate in that, I'm, but I'm hoping I can use it to bring the Korean uh, information, and uh, hopefully you will go out, spread the word that Koreans are not Burmese. Please address us as Koreans, not as Burmese. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Um, that was uh, a very short and very concise uh, sit, um, presentation on the situation in Burma. Maybe I could extrapolate a little bit on that. Burma, as we call it, and you might be confused because it's also now officially known as Myanmar. I guess, I don't know if that was already explained. Oh, okay. Um, but we still, we as the the, the people of Burma who want to see f uh, democracy restored to Burma, we hold on to the name Burma because it was changed by the military regime in power right now to Myanmar. And Myanmar means like, Myanmar is for the Myanmar people, Burma people. They want to see a, a one race nation like that. But we ask the people, <laughs> okay, but we as um, people who want to see democracy in Burma, want to see freedom of rights for every individual in Burma, we, this is our way of resisting, um, resisting the military regime. Burma is a very ethnically diverse country and uh, we are one of the um, ethnics in Burma. The reason why the military regime has been able to still be in power is because of the diversity and they use that diversity to divide and rule which was learned from the British but right now what we are realizing is that for us to survive we need to be together we need to stand together and that is what we are uh, working towards Burman, Kachin, Karen, Chin, all of the ethnics of Burma, we are working together and we have something called the Ethnic Nationalities Council which we are also coming together and trying to build towards um, build towards uh, uh, unity there. Uh, we now here are going to talk, I guess I was told that we were, we were going to talk about the, the influx of refugees from Burma to the United States here. And uh, I think a logical way to look at that is refugees. Why are there refugees? Why did they flee from their country to come to a third country? And then after that, how are they being transplanted? And then the next way is how are they surviving in this new culture here? So maybe the logical way would be to introduce Lori Dawson. She was just there in, in um, I guess this time you didn't go into Burma, but she was right on the border there and she was very close to the situation there. And she has also provided uh, uh, PowerPoint here and I think I would hand over her, the, the mic to her where she could tell us about the situation over there and then you will realize why they are refugees and after you understand why they are refugees then I can update you on how they are being brought over here and then the next step all of us could maybe talk about how we could we could help them survive and then the reason why I think that it's important for you to real uh, to think about that is because since they are coming since I have been here and there are more Karens and other refugees coming here is if we can help them they are not going to be citizens of the United States how can we help them be better citizens of the United States so 
May I please pre present uh, Lori Dawson here. Um, Steve and I have known each other since uh, 1998, but I grew up in Thailand and lived there almost all my life. My parents are... Help! <laughs> okay. Further? Okay. Anyway, um, I did just got back from Thailand last week, and um, I've been over there, kind of, I go back and forth. I've been over there now about four months and two of the months before Christmas, one of those months spent inside Burma. Uh, my brother helped start the Free Burma Rangers, which is a humanitarian relief effort back into Burma, particularly into the ethnic areas of Burma where there is ongoing conflict. That um, group has grown from one team in 97 to 53 teams now throughout the ethnic areas of Burma. And a big part of what we have seen happening in Burma is that we don't see the situation getting much better. But we see that there's a lot of people inside who have not given up and their efforts to try to do the best they can within that country um, through all the difficult problems continues to be a great inspiration. And the Karen who are coming here now, most of those never wanted to leave. Burma's their home. They were driven out. They have no option to go back. And so they're here now. But we continue to help because there's a lot of people still in Burma and still struggling and still pursuing what it is uh, they can do to contribute to their home and to have a one Burma. The issue in Burma is there is nothing unifying that nation to be a one Burma. It has never been a one Burma. So how does it become a one Burma? This is the, the path they're on. And for me, as I look at it, until the regime and the international community recognizes the rights of the ethnic people, who the ethnic people are, and their rights to participate in a One Burma, there will never be a One Burma. And there really shouldn't be. Actually, each of these ethnic groups should be their own country because there is no reason to keep them together. So that, that is kind of the, the very complex country, very complex history, um, but largely because it is struggling to find out how does it become one country. And, and we are a part of that because we are helping the people um, continue to work inside these conflict areas. I put a, we put a PowerPoint together before I left Thailand because um, when I come back here, we try to help and encourage others as why do we, why Burma anyway? <laughs> why do we get involved? What's going on and what can we do? And so we've got um, 10 reasons of why Burma. And I, if I can figure out how to do this properly without pointing it here and there. But uh, the first one is human dignity. That is the number one, is recognize that everybody in Burma counts. Uh, the regime, the ethnic people, every single person matters in that country, and their dignity matters. What's happening right now is people being stripped of that dignity, partic particularly in those ethnic areas. And hammering is going on in Karen State, because the Karen are one of the strongest resistors uh, against the dictatorship, and the dictatorship does not tolerate resistance of any kind. Number two is political prisoners. There are thousands of political prisoners in Burma. And if you know the most famous one, Aung San Suu Kyi, she continues to be held under house arrest, not freed from house arrest, continue to be, try to be sidelined. They'd like her just to leave the country, but she won't. And she won't give up this idea for freedom for all the people of Burma. And she does not want her own freedom at the expense of everybody else's. And she believes in a one Burma that recognizes the rights of the ethnic people. So she is a strong, um, we call it for me, a great inspiration for uh, addressing the real problems of Burma. But that, that puts her in a bad position in Burma because the regime does not want a recognition of the ethics. They don't believe in federalism. They believe in a strong military central government that will dominate the country. Whoops, sorry. The third is uh, forced labor. This is uh, rampant throughout Burma and particularly in the ethnic areas where the Burma army comes in and they use villagers uh, to carry loads, arms, ammunition, food, uh, whatever they need. They usually request from every family, one person a month, maybe two, to porter for them. And it, they porter, uh, they get you know treated horribly, hardly have any food to eat, are forced to carry loads maybe one month, two months, many months before they can even go home. 
Uh, also, number four is religious persecution. This is um, quite dominant against Christians in Burma, but also Muslims, and also Buddhists, if you resist. So uh, they don't discriminate. Uh, it, it mostly, it's because you resist, and the, many of the Christians are Karen, and they're resisting. Uh, restoration of democracy. As you well know, 1990 was an election in Burma, and Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD won the election, but they've never been allowed to take office. You know that elections may be coming up here in the country of Burma, um, but they are elections that will be based on flawed um, laws and a constitution that doesn't acknowledge anybody's rights. And it does not allow for Aung San Suu Kyi to become the leader of the country. Uh, she would be denied that because she is actually, it, it is, anybody who's had committed some kind of crime or they've had uh, lived outside of the country for a certain period of time or they've been married to a foreigner cannot hold office. Um, the sixth is ethnic rights and durable peace. And I think you heard from Steve and Oscar these are, the Karen are just one of the main ethnic groups in Burma. There are a lot. And there are maybe 135 or more different language groups in Burma. A lot of groups are small. A lot of, some groups are bigger, like the Karen and the Shan. But everybody counts, again, in Burma. And their ethnicity is very important to them. Their language, their culture, all of that. So this is a, a big part of what we need to address. Um, particularly from the outside, is understanding this better and recognizing this situation and being able to, to encourage that. Uh, regional security, these are issues you hear about, nuclear desires in Burma. Right now, they, they, uh, I don't know all that much about that, except that they do have uh, some desire to have nuclear power of some capacity. So they're working on that, whether it's for, they say, for medicinal purposes, making medicine, or for power, or for weapons, we don't really know. But under a regime like this, it's probably more for their own power and their own uh, ability to make a, you know, position themselves in the world. Uh, also, threat here, you know, what comes out of Burma is a lot of problems because Burma is uh, disintegrating. They were once one of the wealthiest countries in Southeast Asia, had the highest literacy rate until the 50s, and plummeted after the military coup in 1962 to become one of the worst in the world in terms of poverty and health. And public health is just almost non-existent in that country. And part of what we see trying to happen with engagement, because people see this on the outside, they go, we got to do more. So whatever avenues we can do, we're going to try to take. So if we have to work through the regime in Rangoon to try to help, we will. And some people can do that. And some people, that's what they've got to do, and they've got to keep trying. But on the other side of it, a lot of the bigger problems lie in all these ethnic areas where there's no access, and the regime won't allow anybody to get in. And so we try to come through that back door and help from that side. The other, uh, number nine, is narcotics. Uh, Burma is the number one producer of methamphetamines in Southeast Asia. It's the number two producer of opium and heroin in the world after Afghanistan. So it's got this huge issue of narcotics. One, one thing is it, within the areas where the narcotics are grown, there's no other alternatives for people. And the military don't have uh, you know, the strongest morals, so they can get money through negotiation with some of these ethnic areas that they allow to produce this stuff. And then there's no real ability to eradicate it, and in a lot of ways, no desire, except for from, from uh, different groups that try to get in there, but it's very difficult. Number 10 is the environment, and this is something that I, it's just, it's very sad. And if you, I grew up in Thailand. Thailand had a huge amount of teak forest, a wonderful forest. It was almost disintegrated. They finally had to come back and, and redo Thailand's policies because so much was devastated by poor, you know, environmental efforts there. And Burma is probably, until now, has huge teak forest and tremendous amount of natural resources in, in it's got natural gas, it's got some oil, it's got precious stones, it's got um, lots, of, lots of things.
there. And all the countries around Burma are going, hey, we want a piece of that pie. We've destroyed everything in our country. Let's go after that. So you got Thailand, China, and India all going, ah, ah, and the regime going, yeah, yeah, more money, because then we can build ourselves up. And so there's no, you know, there is nothing to stop them right now. And this is so an effort. There's an organization called Earth Rights International that really started this effort in addressing these issues in Burma, um, along with not only environmental, but how that impacts human, human beings and also their rights. And so a lot of areas in Burma, these people often are forced to work uh, for these uh, groups that, that get uh, mining rights and things like that. And they're also, you know, it's, um, they're building dams now. Those dams will displace a lot of people in the ethnic areas. And there's not a lot of awareness of this, and um, it's difficult in trying to stop the, these types of uh, efforts, but, but people are trying to. Um, but in along with all of this, people of Burma have not given up. That's what uh, is always inspiring and exciting, even in the midst of such horrible things, that people don't give up. And they want to make things better. And so they, they do with what they have, uh, and, and they don't lose hope. And Aung San Suu Kyi is a strong example of this. Even when she has been held under house arrest, of, you know, and, and imprisoned herself for so many years, she's still she's not going to give up. Um, she started rallying the people. Part of the reason why she's under house arrest, this was uh, 2003, she was put back under house arrest. She was trying to reach out to the ethnic people of Burma in the Chin State and Kachin State. And if she could, I bet she would have gone to Karen State. But she could never get there. And the part of why she was put back under house arrest, the regime saw people responding to her. A unifying factor for many of the people of, throughout Burma was recognizing that she wants to see their, their needs and their rights addressed as well. So they put her back under house arrest in 2003, and, and she remains there now. Uh, you might have heard about the Saffron Revolution, they call it in 2007, led by monks who really started with, uh, with um, a protest against the rising prices of gas, you know, fuel and, and commodities in Burma, and the monks um, kind of rose up to take a stand against that. And to, they, they began, moved from being religious to political. And that's a hard thing. You know, Buddhism, most people look at monks as they're not to be political. But they also see, the, just like anywhere, they, they see that actually, you know, if they're gonna stand up for what's right, for other people, they have to be political. And so they did, and that, that whole movement, they started it, but then the rest of the people of Burma, particularly students, joined in. And then it became more political. And then they, monks marched to Aung San Suu Kyi's house and saw her, or she came out, and that made it even more political, so the regime had to put it down. And so they did. And uh, then in 2008, as you re recall, the cyclone hit. The cyclone hit, this is again a representation of what this regime is like. Because this cyclone hit devastating the people of Burma in that Irrawaddy Delta, many of whom are Karen people, and allow those people just to die with no help. There was, the U.S. had a big, huge boat with supplies. The Thais had all kinds of stuff to send in. All the countries of the world were ready to help, but the regime would not allow anybody in. So hundreds of thousands of people affected by that. At the same time that cyclone hit, that regime, because this is a part of the area where we work in and help as Free Burma Rangers, is in this northern Karen state, they were attacking villagers there, forcing them to flee their homes right at the same time. At the same time, they were forcing this new constitution that they have that is a basis for the next elections in, uh, through the whole structure and making it, make, during all this turmoil, to say that everybody voted for this new constitution and putting that in place. This is uh, scenes from that cyclone. And this is from the rice uh, bar, uh, barn that was burned in uh, the village at the same time that that cyclone was happening. And at that villa, I had, I had actually just been to that village before this happened about um, four months before. And we had done a run for relief, which we'll be doing here in Bellingham, but we had done one inside there with a bunch of these kids and had a great time. And here they were four months later running for their lives, literally. And that, that's what goes on in there. 
Um, these are some, this is what happens when they have to flee their home, which is a, usually a nice structure. It's, not a, it's a nice village house, and they have to run. They have to live like this. Sometimes people have to flee. Um, one family or village group had to flee 12 times in one year. This is just a map to show you the conflict areas of Burma, where the red indicates where there is some kind of attack or fighting going on. Um, I would like Steve to explain real quick to you guys about the red, uh, black, and the mixed zones and white zones. This is uh, sort of a, an easy way for the military regime to consider, to explain to their, their people or their, their troops what the areas are. Black zones are like they don't have any control over it, and it's, they have to shoot on sight anybody in that area that they don't, they don't control. The brown zones are kind of iffy. They have some control, but it's not total control. The mixed zones are where they have their, their predominant in that in that area, and uh, the white zones, of course, are are totally under their their control. And uh, that is a very easy way for them to categorize who you are and how they deal with the different people. Uh, uh, they're different citizens. If you're from, if the, you come from a village that they consider uh, in the black zone, then you are, um, even though you may have, you may not have any connection with any resistance or anything at all, just because you're in that black zone, you are discriminated against, and and, and it goes down, down the the line. So in those areas where there are, uh, we can still access are these where these relief efforts can happen through the back door, really, um, through the ethnic areas of Burma where the ethnic people still have the capacity to help their own people. And there we don't have to go through the regime to do this. And so if you look here, there are actually 53 Free Burma Ranger teams now throughout these areas that are highlighted here in, um, in Burma. And you, as you can see, they're mostly these ethnic areas that a lot of them bordering Thailand and then some bordering in India and Bangladesh. It's very hard to, um, again, for the teams to operate anywhere but within these areas that are not fully controlled by the SPDC. This is what kind of re relief looks like, taking in the medicine, medicine and food and supplies in via mules and on people's backs. Um, the medics are, are a lot of people trained in medical relief, addressing again these issues of the lack of medical uh, health care for people in Burma. Um, this is a Shan ethnic uh, medic treating a, um, a Lahu ethnic uh, person and this is a also part of what we try to do and help encourage is the ethnic unity and how do people help each other across these different divides um, and so this is kind of an interesting picture this uh, next one also this was actually a Wa soldier who came for medical treatment uh, from a Kareni medic and uh, so these are little things uh, FBR is kind of we feel like a little band-aid but a little effort to try to help um, people uh, with practical ability to help one another in, a, in conflict areas. Um, these are again, a lot of uh, people support this effort from around the world and they, this one, they we got a big uh, supply of blankets and mosquito nets. There's an Arakan team. You saw probably in the map the Arakan state. There's another team helping in, in that area and Lahu. And these are, again, moving supplies is kind of what uh, some of the areas of Burma look like. Now, this is a significant map. And um, because it tells you also the strategy of the SPDC, and that is to divide and conquer and to take um, all the major, major roads through the ethnic areas of Burma. In Karen State, where, there, where there's still some uh, elements of ability to move, Reason, part of the reason why they can't really take it, number one, it's not their home. Uh, number two, geographically, there's lots of mountains. It's not easy for them to conquer, and they probably never will. 
but they try by taking these roads, major roads to the border, and then building roads across, they cut off people, villagers, and uh, Karen from each other. And so it makes it harder and harder for relief supplies or medical supplies or even the ethnic people to help each other because they have to cross these Burma army controlled roads. You can see these, the, the little circles, red circles are old Burma army camps before 2006. The red diamonds are new Burma army camps since 2006. There were 104 new camps since 2006. And the yellow are expanded camps. They're expanding them. And then all these little, the red dots are roads. And they're continuing to build roads to connect to one another and then section off these areas. Because then they can patrol off, get those villagers in that area either under their control or forced to leave, go into Thailand as refugees or go, you know, away and they can control section by section by section. And um, that is kind of their, their strategy through this area. Steve, you have anything else to say about that? Um, on these roads, there's lots of landmines. Uh, Burma army lays them, and they have to be cleared. The Karen, uh, Karen army, which defends their people there, called the Karen National Liberation Army, also lays landmines to stop the Burma army from coming off that road and into their, down their trails. Because landmines are, are a tremendous problem. Our relief supplies, they have to coordinate a lot. The, the Karen resistance, which this guy sees Karen National Liberation Army, helped to coordinate getting those relief supplies um, across these very dangerous roads to villagers on the other side. And they have to secure, this is a, this is a road here, um, and they've got to get across this. Burma Army is about one kilometer from where these guys are standing right there. Uh, these are villagers, though, in the middle of this, um, in their relief efforts, is trying, and, and the Karen are also very good at this. Even right now, when they're under all this pressure, they keep their schools going. They keep their activities going. They keep their social, they do everything they can to keep their lives as normal as possible. This group here that's gathered, right over that hill is a huge Burma Army camp. It's only about a one hour walk away. But there's, there, this is called resistance right here. All right, health education is a big part also of this effort inside, um, teaching people nutrition, addressing uh, people who are forced to flee to get, you know, how they get medical care, keeping track of that, this whole idea of public health, uh, working with the main systems. What FIBA Rangers do is work also with the main organizations that, um, bigger health organizations too, and, and provide them with that information. Um, these are, again, carrying meals and supplies through uh, this is uh, one another thing that uh, FBR does is to shine a light on the situation and get that word out uh, to the rest of the world. And they take photographs of Burma Army camps. They also uh, interview and talk to people who've been forced to flee. These uh, rice farmers were shot at while they were in their fields, and they had to run, put all their rice. Even that little girl had to carry carry a big load. Um, this little girl house was burned two years ago. Her uncle burned alive, and she's still living there. Family is still, they live about an hour away from that area. They continue to try to hang on to growing their rice and maintaining their, their homes. Um, this is another relief effort here going on. And IDP children, another part is helping these children to, to recognize they're not forgotten in all of this. And the other medics keeping track of, of the medical statistics and helping children in there. This is an abandoned IDP site. Uh, this is a Burma army controlled village relocation site. So uh, just, uh, you know, forcing these villagers to come and live under the control of the Burma army, they will have the villagers move from their own village, come and live there. And if they have to, if they're gonna go and grow their rice, they have to ask permission first, go out and go to their fields, and then they have to be back by certain time in the evening and check back in. So there's a lot of control over them in these relocation sites. These are also uh, women who are forced to porter at that same relocation village. These are also uh, villagers who are forced to porter. Um, another one that was describing what happened to her. 
This one uh, was a young girl that, that one of the relief team leaders met and said, she's you know, uh, 15 years old, never been to school, would like to go to school, but just can't do it. There's no opportunity for her. Um, this is a Burma Army camp. These are trucks uh, moving out. And actually, right now, as I'm speaking, this group you see here, they're attacking right now um, villagers in northern Korean state. Just two weeks ago, they burned down nine homes and killed four villagers. Uh, another effort inside is trying to, these teams will try to be able to uh, work together to communicate out to the world what's happening inside Burma. Um, also taking photographs, the Burma Army camp, continuing the treatment. And I'm just going to go through these kind of quick because uh, I'm not sure of our timing here. Yes, yeah. So I'm just going to swing through some of these and just give you an idea of some pictures here. These are kind of an inspirational story because these two teachers walked several days from an actual Burma Army controlled city called Tangu, their Karen. And they heard about, they knew about their Karen brothers and sisters and villagers forced to flee, and they came out to teach in the IDP areas. And they could have stayed in that city or done whatever else, but they decided they would, they would go and live with uh, these children and help them. A Lego company donated a bunch of Legos um, not long ago, thousands of them. Uh, these are, again, the situation going on at the same time as relief is going on, as uh, right, right now, actually, as I'm speaking, these, the, the <laughs> relief is going on and attacks are going on and studying is going on. Forced labor is going on. And these are an effort to try to um, provide early warning for villagers with communication for through with headmen trying to help villagers um, get warnings ahead of time when Burma Army is coming. This is the Shan area. Really, this is also a situation in the Shan state of Burma. So this is a situation where many homes were burned and forced labor, and this guy, he fell in the fire, but it's just an example of not being able to get any medical treatment in Burma. Again, uh, opium grown there. And this is, just brings you up to what's happening now. And so the attacks that are happening now which are pretty horrific. This is the area. There's actually 3,000 IDPs right now. And that's the area of the attacks going on right now, northern, northern Korean state. Burned homes and um, people shot and killed, villagers fleeing. And, um, you know, again, the more they have to run, the worse it gets for them. They have to do, you know, can't have their children at home, have to have it in the jungle. And again, it's a very, very difficult situation for them. And uh, landmines, people being shot. These kids were you know, wounded by mortars. This guy was wounded and then died later, this young man here. And this just happened here um, just before I left, this situation where nine homes were burned and this lady was killed. This uh, five-year-old boy was killed. This woman was shot. Her five-month-old was shot and died later. And um, now there are thousands fleeing. So this is kind of the last little slide I'll, I'm ending on. I think we'll take some time for questions at this time. If you have a question, raise your hand and we'll get you uh, the mic. I'll run with the microphone to you. And maybe direct it to one of the three, if you could do that. I'm wondering if there's been any UN involvement 
with Burma or awareness? There has, and there have been resolutions and resolutions of resolutions, and nothing happens. As usual, as we've seen with a lot of UN resolutions. But one thing is, is that has been established in 1994, the UN established that for the solution, for there to be a solution of Burma, there, there has to be uh, something they call tripartite talks, meaning that the, the regime in power, the NLD and the Demo democratic uh, forces, and the ethnics. These three parties need to come to a table and start talking about how they would uh, coexist peacefully with mutual respect. To follow up on that a little bit, to think about the relationship uh, between Burma and the international community, I'm wondering if you could speak to, you talked about the exploitation of resources in Burma and the fact that neighboring countries are very interested in that, but I wonder if you could talk about the way in which multinational corporations, and particularly oil companies, um, but corporations with which we have much more direct contact, contact as individuals are supporting the current regime. And you know that's an area where I know we want to do things like run, but we can also address multinational corporations who are supporting this regime. And I wonder if you could Very good that. question. Um, 1997, I think, a uh, lawsuit against the UNICAL, the US UNICAL, uh, I guess conglomerate or corporate oil, corp gas, oil and gas corporation was um, initiated by the organization that Laurie just mentioned, Earth Rights International, and it um, it's a it was a co uh, joint project between Total from France and uh, Unical from California. But the for them to to have that to create that um, project a lot of villagers were just given like five days to get out of their their homes and they weren't able to take anything and they were after five days anybody sh seen in that area would be shot on site and many were so anyway when was when was the time that uh, they actually um, had a settlement it was it took eight years I think eight or nine years and it 2005 something like that I can't remember now but that was that is an example of Unical was saying that look we were just there for the gas the argument was that yeah you were there for the gas but you knew and the money that you were pay and they were saying that all we did was we just paid the uh, the military regime in Burma for their for their expenses well you knew that they were they were attacking the people you knew so the judge, the I can't remember it was a California what district judge, but they did clearly lay out that Unical knew what was happening and therefore was responsible for for the attacks on that and that people. So those are examples of how multinational organiz uh, businesses are in Burma and supporting the regime. that um, the resources that they take, the Burmese, uh, that the multinationals come and take, are not in the Burmese, Burmese government area. They're in the ethnic area. And so it's no, no skin on the back of the Burmese for them to go take it. You know, just give us the money. We will even supply you the protection, which means the elimination of the natives. Uh, so very much like down in Amazon, Oh, they get the, uh, the renters in. So it's a, it's a, a rape. Like, like the Burmese country itself, Burma itself was primarily in the center of Burma. They have abused their land so much that it's desertified there. And so they see the green places of where our natives are, where we still have a, a, a primary um, forest still existing. So they tell the logging companies, we'll give you the concession, go just go get it. 
and then the governing uh, the surrounding countries like India, China, Burma, uh, Thailand, it's they want to keep it status quo because they get it for ten cents on a dollar. And so why let the situation change? Because they can get it so cheap. Now, uh, Steve mentioned Unical. Uh, no, Total. Total is still there uh, and in denial. And uh, but behind, but it is, but American companies are working together with them. I think it's uh, sh either Chevron or Exxon that's still working with them, but behind, so it won't make the wave. So the same thing is going on with um, when they build dams. It's not to benefit the local people. All the uh, energy generated, like in the Kare uh, Kareni state, the dam there, the people are still living with uh, wicks and candlelights where all the energy is diverted to other places uh, and in, even in Rangoon, they get only two hours of electricity a day. All the electricity is diverted to the new town called Napji Dol, where it's built. And I may add that this latest fella, his name is Tan Shui, he's delusionary. He thinks he's a incarnate, reincarnate of a Burmese king, and he is going to uh, make the fourth Burmese empire. And for security reasons, they destroyed 3,000 villages around that area. It's a hilly place, and guess who the 3,000 villages are? Korean villages. So uh, this is how our people are being abused. Uh, we've been, uh, we got a little respite during the early, mid-1800s when the British won the Anglo-Burman War, and that's where our parents got the privilege to study, and even then our parents had to take on Burmese names, like Ba'e is not my name, Ba'e is my father's name, and it's a Burmese name. It's not a Karen name, but all the Karens have to be Burmanized. And uh, fortunately, I didn't, get a, I didn't get a Burmese name, I'm glad. But uh, uh, it isn't that. See, it's been through the years that our people have been subjugated, and centuries. I, I didn't know, you know, it, it, there was an occasion, I, I wondered why, if I have to go to Karen village, I have to drive off from the road. You know, I just had an aha moment recently reading that book. Oh, I see now why, because every time people, the Burmese or the Thai go around, and if, you, if we Karen stay near the village, it's easy, easily accessible for them to be impressed into service. And so so there, I, so now I know why they live far away from the villages, and they deprive themselves of all the uh, the conveniences that, you know, inf infrastructure gives. Going back to your question, just quickly, just, I know the time is up, but just going back quickly to your, your, your question there, there are arguments that, well, when the multi, um, multinational uh, companies come in, it, make, it means work for the locals, maybe, but, but let me give you an example, 2003, that pipeline, that Yadana pipeline was completed. That same exact week, Bur um, the military regime flew over into Moscow and bought 20, 29, uh, bought 11 MiG-29s. So there you have that, which where is, you know, who's helping who? Who's really benefiting from the multinational uh, uh, coming into Burma? I just had a question about for you guys about um, spreading kind of the word of resistance here in the states if that was dangerous at all. What? Um, spreading kind of the word of their resistance and the resistance that's going on if that's dangerous at all for you out of the country. Um, are you talking about supporting the efforts in Burma from here? And there's a U.S. campaign for Burma, which I would recommend 
if you look at their website or they're really kind of set, set up based in Washington, D.C., but to help all of us um, who care about Burma to be a voice through our ability as a part of the democracy in the United States um, to address issues related to Burma through our own, you know, our own representatives and our senators and people like that. And they're, they're very good at helping us do that. And so um, that's kind of where, for me, I work through as I, I give them this information or if I need to talk to somebody, my own representative about this, if I don't know how to do that very well, um, I ask their advice and they help do that. And if there's bigger um, issues going on that we can all get involved in, um, particularly con contacting our Congress people about these things, they help to organize that on a, on a bigger way. And they're also tied into the UN, what's happening in the UN, and they're a big part of, um, of uh, this, the latest um, kind of effort to address the crimes against humanity that are going on uh, under this regime. This is U.S. Campaign for Burma. If you go to the website, it's uscampaignforburma.org. Have there been resistant groups of Burmese working with the Karen and the um, ethnic groups? There, ha there has been uh, actual Burman uh, uh, resistance, although there were, in fact, the first um, ele democratically elected prime minister, Unu, actually. Uh, resisted against the 1962 uh, coup and General Nguyen at the time, and they General um, Unu actually worked a little bit with the Karen and other uh, ethnic resistances. The Burmese history, right after independence, you know, Karens had want uh, the British really royally sold us loyal Karens out. Uh, we are known as the Forgotten Allies, and there's a documentary called that. And we, um, I guess, Stilwell, uh, he was from the Chindits, uh, the, uh, the American troops that went to help in the Burma theater. It was the Burmese that brought the Japanese into Burma to fight against the Allies. But yet, when independence came, for expediency, the, Jap uh, the British turned over independence to the Burmese, knowing full well the animosity or uh, the, the depravity of the Burmese independence army had done against the Karens during the Japanese occupation. Yet, we were left hanging. And uh, so, our history um, has, is, is very, very sad. I fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't get to grow up. Um, I don't even speak Karen well. I'm just learning to speak Karen. But now that I'm retired, I have the luxury now to go back. And I will be back in the Karen state pretty soon. Uh, but like, um, see, even the Karens in 1949 has almost captured Rangoon, we were just nine miles, but the Burmese says, oh, let's have a truce. So Karens naively, uh, in good faith, went in there, but while we were, while the truce was going on, the Burmese were surrounding our Karen people, waiting for shipment of arms to get in, and guess who supplied them? The British supplied them arms. So that's where we, we, we were naive politically, we're still naive. We're just simple people. We are not artful at all. And so please don't forget that we are not, Karens are not Burmese. And Karen activists, the, the, the great, the many works that we get, like when, when people visited the White House, they say Burmese activists. Not one of them are Burmese. Out of four of them, three of them are Karens, one of them is Shan, which doesn't even know a word of Burmese. But yet, the uh, kudos goes to them. 
It's the same thing with when reparation came. It was the Burmese that fought against the British. The Karens and the ethnic people died. But when the reparation came from the Japanese, all of them went to the Burmese. So what's, life's not fair, is it? there's a division in the Karen people between Buddhists and Christians. So my question is, how is that going currently today? I know there was some uh, problem with the Buddhists in the military, with the Burmese military, quite a while back. So my question is, are the Karen finding unity between their own people? And on the same token, are other ethnic groups in Burma able to come together or is that part of the Burmese strategy to divide the ethnic groups and conquer them separately? That's exactly the problem in Burma. Um, if you go back logically to who becomes a leader anywhere in the world, who becomes a leader, it's somebody who has education. And Burma, during the, the rule of the British, the best schools in Burma were mi um, missionary schools. And so the people that came out of those schools were edu educated. And people who were not, and most of them became Christians. And uh, a lot of them who did not go to school did not have the education. So later on in life, right now, up to now, you'll see the people who have been educated in those schools that were Christians became the leaders. Well, the, SP, the, the military regime took that and said, look, you guys, look, the Christians, you guys are saying that we, you were oppressed by us, but look, you're being oppressed by the Christians, so you Buddhists need to stand up against that. And so that, that's how, and then the, 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 the Buddhists also thought, okay, that's true. Then they, they suddenly realized that, now they're realizing that, but they're sort of caught in a, in a what do you call that, in a, in a circle, in a circle of life right now because they accepted the monetary gain from the SPDC right now, the, the military regime right now. And so to get off that wheel, it's like they've gotten used to the money, but they, they can't quite give that up. And so they're caught in this not wanting to work with the military regime, but still, having, still wanting to retain the gain and so they're having to, so there's all of this complexity in, in Burma where, where um, um, there's division. There's a lot of division. I don't know if you recall 1988, the 888 uh, before the Tiananmen Square. There, there was a student revolution of 888 and the Burmese students primarily uh, retreated or fled to the Karen area. And the Karen, oh, the enemy of our enemy is our enemy, is our friend. So we accepted their land. But that was a big mistake because along with them came spies. And they were able to find out the territory, the weaknesses of the uh, geographical location. So by 1995, they, they, they have already worked into the Buddhist Karen split. And by 19 One small effort, I think, you know, that this is a situation for what we can do on the outside to help when we talk about unity is a recognition of who all these ethnic people are and, and also our desire to see them have a full right to participate in the country if it's going to be one country. And that's something we can do more of is, and as you're learning about it and, and seeing, you know, who all these people are and understanding their role. But the, for Free Burma Rangers, which is a, a small effort on this end, is to bring ethnic people together uh, across and, and build a, um, practical ways 
that you can work together, which is a medical kind of humanitarian relief. Um, but the part that we still don't have is the Burman part because there is a big separation and this is a, this is a big problem. And I know that many Burman people see this, but they don't know how, how do you address it. And until they have, um, uh, until this regime f either falls or completely changes somehow to become something different and really recognizing this, then there will be no unity. This is, this is the reality. The unity for that country is tremendously difficult under the circumstances it's in right now. And I know, um, Many people like to do more, but, but like you're talking about DKBA and the KNU and all that, you know, once you're, like Steve was saying, you know, people want to survive in their home too. They don't want to be shot at and forced to flee. So if you make a deal with the Burma army that you're not going to be shot at and flee and you can, you know, you got to do, you know, you can stay in your own place and we'll give you some, some money and business concessions and you can keep your arms and, you know, that's kind of inviting. But then all of a sudden you find yourself fighting against your brother and sister, uh, and you go, okay, wait a minute, I don't really want to do that, but you're kind of stuck. And so these are real things people face every day, and um, I think a big part for us uh, who are outside, you know, we're, we're, we need to understand this better and recognize it and start talking about the ethnic people um, in a stronger way. That's exactly where I'm going. You know, the, the media wants us to think that it's one big homogenous country, Burmese, they don't know that the Karens are there, the Shans are there, the Chins are there. Primarily the Karens are the re biggest resistance to the Burmese and they want to annihilate us. And this is my mission to let the world know that Karen, please call us Karen activists, not Burmese activists. We are Karen refugees. There are Burmese refugees, but very, very few Burmese refugees. I would like to leave whoever is inter interested in Burma with one thought on Burma, and that is, yes, there needs to be peaceful coexistence in Burma, and we are working towards that. But for peaceful coexistence in Burma, there has to be mutual respect. There has to be mutual respect between the different ethnics and um, the different uh, faiths, and however different you are, if I don't respect you, then then you can't respect me and I can't live together with you, that sort of thing. So, so I think I would like to leave you with the thought that for peaceful coexistence, there has to be mutual respect. <laughs>